All right, so I'd like to talk to you about what we uh, went over in class today. It was a lot. So I'm going to start over here on the heart's electrical system. Um, and you had this reading um, last week. And so today what I was trying to point out was our primary um, intrinsic or electrical uh, control system of our heart is our sinoatrial node. This will maintain an average of 60 to 100 beats per minute at rest. It will also allow to um, increase or decrease that depending upon the requirements on the body. However, if that SA node is not able to do its function, it has backups, multiple backups. However, typically, when the heart is working well, the SA node will fire, triggering an AV node to also then fire moments after. Then there's a little bit of a delay so that all of the um, lower or ventricular nodes can illuminate and then they will contract. And actually, they'll contract from the apex moving up to eject the blood. So we have quite a few things going. We have this big electrical system with lots of wiring. When the SA node fires, it actually has to slow this side and allow for this side to keep up. It's a very fr small fraction of a second that allows this uh, time to uh, innervate both of the atria and then they contract. Um, then there's a bit of a pause before the next contraction or component of the contraction will happen because that uh, trigger needs to get spread through the bundle of his down the two bundles, the bundle branches, and throughout all of the different fibers, Purkinje and smaller fibers throughout the muscularity of the ventricles, and then they will contract. So what I was trying to get after was the fact that if one of these systems is faulty, then there are other backups. So what we added today was that your sinoatrial node, which is typically called your pacemaker, will maintain a fairly satisfactorily strong, um, adjustable when needed kind of uh, rate, heart rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. The AV node, which is called the gatekeeper, can actually maintain a very comfortable uh, 40 to 60 beats per minute uh, as an average. It can increase and decrease as need happens. However, this is something that would need to be managed by your medical professional, and um, there would be some considerations depending upon the overall health of your heart muscle, whether or not this is going to be an individual who does need some electronic support. Uh, then, if we do have faulty SA or AV nodes, then we can depend on um, the bundle branches. So the bundle of hiss and then the bundle branches can actually trigger and fire ventricular contraction on their own. They, however, are not going to do it for long term. They are great for temporary support. Um, your bundle of hiss can take, through, take you through a 40 to 60 beat per minute temporary period of time, so it's multiple days typically. Um, and then the Purkinje fibers can also maintain some life-saving impulse um, triggering, but that's only at a 20 to 40 beats per minute, and again, that's also temporary. So we were just looking at the innervation of the heart. Then we went through and added a little bit more detail um, over here. We kind of summed things up, gave you some very, very basic pieces, and then mentioned that normal sinus rhythm is what we would call a standard and healthy heart rate. It also would be looked at in conjunction with an electrical image of the um, impulse moving through our heart. Talked very, very briefly about how this EKG, commonly called an EKG or ECG, um, is determined, and that's typically from a 12-lead electrocardiogram, where we put a whole bunch of electrical sensors on your body, over, on your skin, um, around your heart, on your limbs, to try and get some images of your electrical activity. And they're images in a 3D, of course, a 3D um, pathway. So some electrical... Uh, uh, EKG leads or pathways will look significantly different than this. This is not the only way that a lead would look. This is just one of many. So they will use this setup to try and triangulate views across through um, from the top up from the bottom down of the electrical activity of the heart. So 
This classic um, PQRST wave is going to be the one that we're used to, and it's not the most important, but it's definitely a major component in evaluating the strength and health of your electrical control system. So what we're looking at here is a P wave, that's your first marker on the this particular EKG. Then we see the QRS wave, which would be when our ventricles are really taking action. The P wave is when our atria is contracting, atrial uh, systole, systole means contraction. Then here we have our ventricular contraction, and that comes in a couple of uh, phases. When the ventricles start to contract, they actually contract a bit on the volume, and that slams the AV doors shut, making the first heart sound. But then they can continue to contract, and it's kind of like if I was pushing on the table. The table's not going to move until something gives way. Now, if I push on this really, really hard, and the legs of the table, under my incredible strength and force, give way, well, then the table's going to drop. But really what I'm talking about here is these ventricles will con contract, slamming the AV valves shut, and then they'll continue to contract until the outlet is opened. The outlets would be the pulmonary semilunar valve and the atrial semilunar valve. When the, once those two valves pop open, then the ventricle can physically contract. It's no longer an isometric contraction where there's no movement. It's actually going to go through that movement and crush or eject the blood out of the two ventricles through the semilunar valves and their corresponding vessels. At the end of our depolarization of our atria, then our depolarization of our ventricles, then we start to get repolarization. Repolarization of our atria starts in here, and then over here we're going to see that our ventricles relax and they become repolarized. Again, a lot of this language that you're hearing me saying depolarization and repolarization, that very much should sound familiar as not that long ago we were looking at how an action potential moves through a neuron. And so we saw this threshold reach, then we saw the depolarization and the repolarization of a neuron. So we're still looking at the same kind of electrical charge, but we're looking at that in the heart muscle, in the cardiac muscle. You can see here that I've gone ahead and thrown in our lub and our dub, our first heart sound, which is the AV valve slamming closed as the ventricles start to contract. And then we see our dub would be our semilunar valves. When they shut, they shut with quite a force because the pressure in both the pulmonary artery and the aorta is really, really high. There's so much blood forced out through them when the ventricles contract that the moment the ventricles relax, blood tries to come back. And that actually slams those semilunar valves shut, which is a good thing because we don't want backflow. So take a little bit of time perusing some of these images. I've got a, just a little bit of a reminder about the three types of muscle, smooth muscle, or involuntary muscle is going to be your digest digestive tract, your bladder, your uterus. Skeletal muscles are the muscles that we're most familiar with. Cardiac muscle is our heart muscle, and you saw the bulk of your cardiac muscle is called myocardium that is wrapped uh, by endo and epicardium. Um, cardiac muscle doesn't do well with damage, so we want to make certain that we understand you just don't regrow uh, or replace a lot of cardiac muscle. That cardiac muscle uh, does not do mitosis. Uh, typically there is some repair that can happen, but not an awful lot.